So hello learners, this is unit 1, American drama and introduction of block 1 from IGNOU BEGC 105, that is American Literature. So basically this is from American Literature, Book of IGNO University, IGNO University and we'll be covering the unit 1. Objectives, I think we don't need to go into much details about it. We will just go through a quick overview while keeping in mind all the important topics and words necessary. So let's start with introduction directly. American drama began in the American colonies in the 17th century and has continued developing to the present. The American drama of the 18th and 19th centuries mostly had British influence on it. In fact, until 1910, the New York City theatre season presented more British plays than American plays. So what it says is that American drama began in the American colonies. It means that uh, those American states which were occupied by other countries and uh, were uh, their colonies. Like India was a colony of the British in the same way, many American states were uh, colonies of different countries, mostly Britain. So in the 17th century and has continued developing to the present. So American drama began in these American colonies which were occupied uh, by other countries in these American colonies in the 17th century. Uh, it means in the 1600s because we count one uh, after the century. So if it's 17th century then the century was 1600s. If it's 18th century then it was 1700s and so on. The American drama of the 18th and 19th centuries mostly had British influence on it. So what they say that are the American drama of the 1700s and 1800s mostly had British influence on it. It was mostly influenced by the British drama or the British people. In fact, until 1910, 1910 is the 20th century. So in fact, until 1910, the New York City Theatre, City Theatre, New York City Theatre is uh, nothing special. It's just the name of uh, a theatre in New York. Season presented more British plays than American plays. So it's saying that uh, the American, uh, the sorry, the New York City Theatre, New York City Theatre presented more British plays than it presented the American plays. So this is the scope of, uh, this was the scope of the British drama versus the uh, American drama. So American drama you can see is uh, that it wasn't as at all popular. And since New York City falls uh, near the, Amer uh, falls in America, but still it presented more of the British plays rather than its own indigenous, its country plays. So this was how much uh, British drama was popular against the American drama. Now, uh, the common language and the ready availability of British plays and British actors was the reason for their domination. Now, they're saying what was the reason for it. So, two points that should be marked, uh, not yet. We'll cover it later on, after covering the introduction part. So, American drama began, uh, sorry, the common language and ready availability. So, British language was a very commonly spoken language because if you recall, the Americans uh, were actually... Indig the indigenous Americans were actually black Indians, right? No, they weren't from India, but they were called Indians. They were called Indians. So it was a primitive tribe that was, uh, that had born in America itself. But then from people from uh, Spain, I guess, or maybe from the, the thing is that from the European parts, people traveled to America and occupied these lands basically and uh, ruled over these Indians. Over time, they killed, they eventually ended up killing all the Indians or mating with them and the rest died out naturally. So the population started uh, living, the British population now started living in America and that's how the present America is formed. So uh, it's obvious that since the language there was, uh, it should be a mix of a British language because the uh, British people had come to settle in the American land. So the uh, so their language was still uh, more uh, more familiar with the British language instead of the indigenous language of the black Indians. That's why uh, people uh, easily grasp the British language instead of the uh, indigenous American language. So the British language was easy for these people. This is the first point why the America, why the British drama was popular. Second reason was that uh, the British actors were easily available because there was no computer, no TVs at those times. So people basically watched drama live. 
in front of them while uh, the actors enacted it it wasn't like you uh, performed a play whenever you find the found the actors and then you just published it online and people started watching it through their tvs or through their phones it wasn't like this you had to enact the play in front of the audience in re real time so they required actors for that and uh, british actors were easily available while american actors were not American drama began to diverge from British drama around the 1830s. So American drama started differentiating, started uh, going uh, different from the um, uh, from the British drama during the 1830s. That is, in the 19th century. Despite this growing divergence, most American plays continued to copy British model till the early 20th century. So they're saying that despite that American drama had started diverging from the British drama around the 1830s that is in the 19th century uh, there were still um, most of the American plays that still copied the British model uh, till the 20th early 20th century too so they're saying that uh, the drama had started diverging around the 1830s but even till 1910 1920s there were still people who copied British uh, there were still most of the American writers who copied the British drama or took inspiration from it for this reason and for this reason critics claim that American drama was born only at the end of World War one with Eugene O'Neill in the 1920s so they're saying that the real the actual American drama was born in the 1920s after the end of World War one with the dramas of Eugene O'Neill with the writings of Eugene O'Neill by the end of the 19th century that is by the end of 1800s 19th century American drama had moved towards realism so it says that during the 1900s during the start of the early years of the 1900s American drama had started to move towards realism what is realism realism means realism in art means showing things as they really are so they weren't into fantasy they weren't into some supernatural things they were into realism it means they showed human emotions situations things as they really were they took real life social situations realism dominated both comedies and tragedies even in the 20th century so realism was used not only in the tragic tragic sense tragic sense sorry. it was also used in comedies even in the uh, 20th century and as the century advanced american drama took up broader issues of race gender sexuality and death so as the century advanced american drama took several other issues as well now the two points that now sorry you know two points uh, there are some points that should be marked out in the introduction which is let me mark them up here 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 until here okay oh sorry what did this happen So you should highlight this point up to here, up to here. Oh, my highlighter is not working. I don't know why it's not working. Maybe I got something wrong, but whatever. So you know where to mark this and the second in fact until 1900 and the common language. Now mark these points as well. These points are also important from here to here. American drama began to diverge despite this uh, N. The third point here is in the 1920s. This is the third point. Critics from critics. You can mark it from critics to here. By now moving on 1.2 American drama around Arthur Miller beginnings of American drama 1600s and 1700s so we're talking about 17th and 18th centuries here like little theatrical activity took place before the mid 18th century because the early settlers of American colonies faced harsh living conditions after migrating to this Indian land so 
they are saying that uh, during this time during the 1600s and 1700s so they're saying very little theatrical activity took place before the mid 18th century mid 18th means before the 1750s so before the 1750s there was very little theatrical activity why the reason for it because american uh, settlers sorry settlers in american colonies they faced harsh living conditions so america by this time was already a colony and uh, british people started settling down in these american colonies and because they faced very harsh living conditions there wasn't much of uh, uh, there wasn't much of a theatrical activity in here their belief in hard work frugality and pity also al disallowed them from indulging in theatrical activity so much so that the play ye bear and ye cub produced in 1665 and probably the first theatrical performance in america led to the trial of actors so what it's saying is that their belief in so these uh, people believed in hard work who who are these people these are american settlers or you can say that uh, these are migrants migrants people migrating to america british migrants so they believed in hard work frugality now what is frugality frugality means the quality of being careful when using money okay uh their belief in hard work frugality and pt pt means a way of behaving that shows deep respect for god or any kind of religion that you might have or your elder in fact in fact so this this allowed them from indulging in theatrical activity so they believed that uh, theatrical activities were a waste of money and a kind of disrespect towards the god because uh, according to church gods uh, christ forbid any kind of uh, uh, enjoyable activities like drama or da dancing and singing uh, christ actually uh, did not support these kind of activities so the church believed that uh, theater was against the gods theater was against the gods will and theaters were actually a form of disrespect to gods so the british also naturally believed in the church believes that's why uh, only some people which were uh, indulged in the theatrical activities they believed that this was not so and uh, means their beliefs were different from the church and most of the majority of the people and even though the majority too liked these drama and these theatrical activities but they were too afraid or they were i don't know they just didn't want to show uh, that they were against the church and maybe they were afraid of god's wrath or something but so much so the thing is that uh, their hard work uh, their belief in hard work frugality and pity and of course they believed that watching drama was a waste of money as it was just a kind of entertainment so in today's uh, time it's very common you go watch a movie buy some tickets eat some popcorn spend around uh, 2 to 3k in each movie i guess but Uh, for the people of those times there weren't many sources of entertainment even such entertainment was required uh, some kind of money it was like uh, a wastage of money only the real rich could afford forms of entertainment for the lower class or middle class people it was like uh, you should work hard and earn lots of money for your livelihood and comforts not for entertainment so this was considered kind of bad uh, so this uh, disallowed them from indulging in theatrical activity as yes, this much is clear and it was it had such an influence on them that the uh, ye bear and ye cub it was a play produced in 1665 and probably the first theatrical performance in america and this was the first performance that was done in america now you can say how was this the first performance in america when there were plays still being made so it was mostly in british it was mostly in uh, the britain and european areas where the plays were made and enacted but not in america in america this was the first play that was actually enacted in the 18th uh, so much that it led to the trial of the actors that the uh, actors were actually led to a trial uh, here i mean the trial the process in which a court of law uh, in which a court of law and a judge listens to evidence and decides if somebody is guilty of a crime or not that trial this is what i'm talking about so they face criminal charges against them uh, because they uh, performed a play because they performed a play that's why they were actually uh, sent criminal charges so in the 18th century many colonies in america enacted laws forbidding the performance play and now as we can see there were many colonies in america later on which um, forbid the performance of play which actually enacted which actually passed laws forbidding the performance of plays 
because of the puritan belief that the seventh of the 10th command 10 commandments in the bible did not allow dancing in nectic plays so this is the reference to the bible there are some sections uh, seventh of the 10th commandments i don't know what it about uh, but the main thing here is that the bible did not allow dancing and enacting plays uh, i guess i just need to uh, pause it for a bit so i can check my highlighter well so this time i switched to adobe acrobat i still haven't found any highlighter in it but uh, the interface is cool so i guess i'll go with it Anyways, where were we? Uh, we were, however, opposition to theatre did not last long. Aware of the new cultural beginnings, the colonies wanted to brush up their intellectual and oratorical skills by theatrical activities. The 17th century colleges in several colonies allowed theatrical activity after much hesitation, which they thought could benefit students to utilize their speech skills in their careers, such as businesses and law. To meet this requirement, the first play, Andrew Boros, written by Robert Hunter, an English governor, came as an attack on his political enemies despite New York's anti-theater law. So you can mark this point too. Up to here, I guess. Oh gosh, this is annoying, seriously, but now you know where to mark. From uh the first play from here the first play to anti theater la here as to the reason why we are doing this in uh soft copy form today and not through actual hard file physical books it's because i still haven't got my igno u books for which i had paid i guess about uh, 4 months ago Anyways, to meet this requirement, the first play, Andrew Boris. Andrew Boris was a play written in 1774 by Robert Hunter, who was an English governor, not American, English governor. And it came as an attack on his political enemies. So English governor here means a governor from England. He wasn't American. It means a governor from England, from the British side, maybe, I guess. Came as an attack on his political enemies, despite New York's anti-theater law. So, despite New York's anti-theater laws, uh, Robert Hunter wrote an, uh, a play. Robert Hunter wrote a play and published it. This play established the tradition of political satire charting out the course that American drama was to follow for the next two centuries. So, this play is especially important. Why? Because it set out the course. Uh, it set out the course. It's a, uh, the tradition of political satire. So it established the tradition of political satire. So for the next two centuries, such political satire followed the American drama. What is political satire? Uh, satire means criticizing people or ideas in a humorous way. So uh, they, they basically criticized politicians or politics in a humorous way, uh, in an indirect way, uh, which wasn't offending or which wasn't directly offending, you can say. Uh, so this was done, this uh, this became a part, this was a very uh, dominative part of the American drama for the next two centuries. Several popular plays of this period were The Paxton Boys, which came in 1732, The Trial of Atticus, whose authorship is not known, and Robert Munford's The Candidates of the Humors of a Virginia Election. So now you might ask me that uh, Andrew Boris was written in 1774. Whereas the Paxton Boys were written in 1732. So how come Andrew Boris is the first play whereas the Paxton Boys is not? So there are several different opinions over it. Uh, some people are saying that the actual first American plays was in fact uh, The Prince of Parthia by Thomas Godfrey which was in 1767. Some people are saying some different things and here as we can uh, very easily see that the Paxton Boys came before Andrew Boris. So it should be the first uh, play instead of Androboros. So I don't know how this setting is, uh, how the IGNU has placed these plays according to their position in history, but let's just continue it. There's no need to delve uh, deep into it. It's just superficial. So before more plays appeared, a group of British professional actors formed a touring circuit in the 1750s. In the 1750s, here. Wow. so you can check it out more clearly now 
so before more plays appeared a group of british professional actors formed a touring circuit what is a touring circuit a touring circuit is a route having at least three major tourist destinations which are distinct and apart so it's a route which has at least three major tourist destinations and which are distinct tourist destination which are different from each other and are apart from each other not at the same place all right so this is a touring destination this is a touring circuit so they formed a touring circuit in the 1750s and this group in the early 1760s was known as the american company so this is here it comes the play the prince of parthia which i was talking about which was the first american professional play i don't know how this is going on as now we can see that it was uh, produced in 1767 before more plays appeared and this group in the early 1760s was known as the american company so you need to remember this it was uh, known as an american company the american company in 1767 you need to remember this information too that in 1767 they staged a play the prince of parthia a tragedy by thomas godfrey the first professional production of a play written in america professional pr production why because it was used to gather money it was used to amass money before that uh, the play was for uh, universities was for educational purposes only androborus uh, the play that we talked about here androborus uh, which was written by robert hunter was a play uh, that wasn't written to uh, which wasn't written for monetary gains it was only for uh, educational purposes as we have read but this play was for monetary gains it was a professional play during the american revolution uh, revolution many professional actors moved to jamaica during the period of American Revolution, satirical plays, satirical plays, as I already told you, criticizing people or ideas in a humorous way. So such plays were written either supporting British control of the colonies or attacking it. So most of the plays were uh, stuck up on this agenda of whether the American, uh, whether sorry, whether the British are doing good by occupying colonies, by making other kind of other states their colonies and uh, attacking, or is it bad that they are attacking it? Is it bad that they are not actually just occupying it, they are destroying their culture, their heritage, they are attacking those colonies. The Battle of Brooklyn, which was a pro-British and written anonymously. So the Battle of Brooklyn, this supported British, it means pro-British means it supported British. And it was written anonymously means we don't know who the writer was. It is uh, not in our knowledge. So written anonymously, satirized leaders like George Washington. Satirize is just a form of satire. So it satirized uh, the it satirized leaders like George Washington, Mercy Otis Warren, the strongest American dramatist, dramatic voice of the revolution. So uh, Mercy Otis Warren, the strongest American dramatic voice of the revolution, presented the revolutionary case, uh, cause in her play, The Adel Chair, The Defeat, The Group, The Black Hats. A play by Robert Munford, The Patriots, attained true dramatic character by taking a neural stance and attacking both sides for the intolerance. So, Mercy Otis Warren was a very was the strongest American uh, drama voice during this time, during the revolutionary time, and uh, he or she, I guess it was probably he, uh, presented the revolutionary cause. Sorry, she. Sorry, it was she. So she presented revolutionary causes in her plays. Uh, some of her play, famous plays are written as follows. And Robert Munford uh, wrote The Patriots. It was another play which attacked both the sides. The people supporting the British and the people not supporting the British. So the professional actors had moved to Jamaica. Now we will go through it again. The professional actors who had moved to Jamaica during the American Revolution were touring America again in the mid 1780s. So those professional actors who had gone to Jamaica during the American Revolution were again back in America during the 1780s. I don't know why, but let's see. America became a nation in 1783 through a victory against the British colonial power. So during the 1780s, 1780s was a time of what? Uh, just give me a moment and I'll check it out. So 
1789. So this was the uh, 1789, 14 July, early morning. This was the morning of the French Revolution, or you can say the start of French Revolution, as this was the time when Bastille, the fort, uh, the fortress, was destroyed by the people of Paris. And uh, if you remember correctly, then uh, Louis XVI, who was uh, the French king, had actually helped uh, 13 American colonies to gain their independence from Britain. So I guess it was about this time that this thing happened. Anyways, uh, Robert Taylor was the first playwright of the nation to write the finest American play of the 18th century, The Contrast. So Robert Taylor was the first playwright, playwright is the person who writes plays of the nation. He was the first playwright of the nation to write the finest American play of the 18th century, it means of the 1700s, which was The Contrast, written in 1787. This five-act comedy that satirizes the customs of the upper class is written in the format of British co comedy, owing much to Sheridan's The School for Scandal. So this was actually take, this had taken inspiration from The School of Sen uh, Scandal. I guess it was a, uh, basically a British drama. So uh, the contrast also took a lot of inspiration from the British comedy. American drama 1800s. Uh, William Dunlop introduced melodrama in his plays. What is melodrama? A story play of film in which a lot of exciting things happen and in which people's emotions are stronger than in real life. Melodrama is basically our uh, present day movies where there is a hero, there's a heroine, there's a villain, the villain kidnaps the heroine, the hero goes uh, on his quest to rescue the heroine and then they live happily after, after killing the villain. That's it. So this was basically melodrama. Uh, William Dunlop introduced melodrama in his plays, the most prevalent dramatic form in the 19th century. So melodrama was the most loved form of drama during the 19th century, that is in the 1800s. The credit for giving drama its most important characteristic, dramatic conflict, also goes to him. Most of his plays were adaptations or translations from French and German. So most of his plays were taken from French plays or German plays and translated or just taking some uh, some uh, adaptations from there. Like here he took some part of it and made a drama over it or took some sequ uh, or took some act from it, uh, took a whole act from the drama and made a uh, rest of the part over it. It's something similar to that. The protagonist Major John Andre in Dunlop's play and shows admirable qualities by saving a young American captain despite George Washington's unqualified antagonism towards him for conspiring to destroy an American garrison. Okay, now this is a little bit difficult, but let's move on with it. So the protagonist is Major John Andrew in Dunlop's play Andrew. The name of the drama is also Andrew. It was produced in 1798. So he shows admirable qualities, uh, qualities that are worth admiring by saving a young American captain. So he saves a young American captain despite George Washington's unqualified antagonism towards him. So antagonism is a feeling of hate and of being uh, against somebody or someone. So George uh, Washington sh shows antagonism towards him for conspiring to destroy an American, an American garrison. Okay, I think this is very clear. We're going in a little too bit depth. Majority of the plays written in America in the 19th century were largely produced for commercial purposes to benefit the heterogeneous public residing all over America, whose primary interest was seeing the shows and their favorite actors performing in these plays. So, yeah, you, it's better if you uh, highlight this also. No, up to, I think... Uh, up to here from here to here oh shit what is this also goes to him so you can just yeah up to this point all right so majority of the majority of the plays written in America during the 19th century, that is during the 1800s, uh, they were largely produced for commercial purposes, that is to gain money, to earn money from them. That is why they were produced to benefit the hetero over large part of commercial purposes, to benefit the heterogeneous public residing all over America. 
एंड एंड इट वॉज ऑल्सो टू द बेनिफिट ऑफ द हेड्रोजीनियस पब्लिक हेड्रोजीनियस मीन्स डाइवर्स इन कैरेक्टर कंटेंट सो लाइक इंडिया हैज अ हेड्रोजीनियस पॉपुलेशन देर आर ऑल काइंड ऑफ पीपल सिमिलरली देर आर ऑल काइंड ऑफ पीपल साइडिंग ऑल ओवर अमेरिका बट देयर प्राइमरी इंटरेस्ट वॉज सींग द शोज एंड देयर फेवरेट एक्टर्स परफॉर्मिंग इन दीज प्लेस राइट सो बिकॉज दे वॉन्टेड दिस द प्रोडक्शन हाउस इज डेड वर्ट दे प्रोड्यूस मोर प्लेयर्स विद देयर फेवरेट एक्टर्स to earn money now earlier this was done for educational purposes or simply for entertainment cheap form of entertainment but now people were so much in love with dramas that it became a major company it became a major production unit so <coughs> dramas were made for people uh, with their favorite actors and uh, with the kind of shows that people would like earlier it was like a writer thought of a play and he maybe saw inspiration from other play and he decided to uh, produce it he wasn't sure whether people liked it whether people will not he didn't care either it was like he just wanted to show his skills to the people but now the people had to fabricate the drama according uh, sorry the producers the producers the dramatists the playwrights they had to fabricate the drama according to the people's needs according to the people's uh, wishes their <coughs> sorry what was the word i can't remember it anyways most of the plays were not published uh, but were meant only to be seen and not to be read as a result they are now irrevocably rest so this is a very important point which you should mark it down most of these plays were not published that is they were not written and published off to be read they were actually only to be seen they uh, were to be seen while being performed they weren't uh, they weren't there to be read so it wasn't like nowadays you write a drama in a book uh, you most likely publish it and then people would read it from the book but those at those times they enacted the plays one playwright had the copy of the play maybe the actor also had the copy of the play but it wasn't actually available to the general public to be read at such a large sequence like it is in today's time so basically it was only for the uh, only for the easy uh, availability of the play so did the actors and the play, and the writers don't have any kind of difficulty functioning right now so these plays are that uh, for this reason are irrevocably lost and irrevocably means in a way that cannot be changed that is permanently lost now one of dunlop's contemporary contemporary means uh, this person was uh, during dunlop's time so while dunlop was alive this person was also alive during that time so one of dunlop's contemporary james nelson barker produced some of the best known works marmion in 1812 and superstition in 1824 the latter it means uh, latter means superstition the later one the thing that came later on a romantic tragedy based on specific american situations was set in new england and explored the themes of isolationism by gotry and intolerance so isolationism i think it's uh, a very easy word everyone knows it by gotry by gotry is the fact of having and expressing strong unreasonable beliefs and disliking other people who have different beliefs or a different way of life all right is it clear so bigotry is the fact of having and expressing strong unreasonable beliefs it's very similar to more and day religion see let's say very strong unreasonable belief so you say that all these things are controlled by some superhuman being which is god so this is a completely unreasonable belief right if you uh, let's say the first person who came up with this idea said this nowadays everyone believes in god everyone has some kind of religion or the other so they will say yeah of course such a kind of thing exists yeah this happens but let's uh, think about the first person who came up with this idea that all these supernatural things or all the things that happen in this world are actually controlled by one super being that is god so it was a very unreasonable belief and let's say that pe- some pe- other people believe differently they said no it happens by itself they the pe- pe- or maybe some people believed in science and they tried to counter attack his thoughts and then the st- uh, the person started hating and uh, disliking the other person so it means he has bigotry beliefs he is bigotry person so next is what was next where were we by godrey and intolerance the indian princess written in 1808 written by him written by him who written by who uh, written by james nelson barker written by him was the first play to explore native american themes and characters it told the story of 
Pocahontas. 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 So it told the story of Pocahontas, a Native American woman who married in Eng <coughs> It's written wrong here. It should be married an Englishman. Now, the most well known of such drama was Metamora by John Augustus Stone. So there were uh, there were other dramas written like this too, but the most famous of them was Metamora, which was written by John Augustus Stone. Now it's important that you remember these two dramas' names because there's not much about the Native Americans or about such interwoven themes. So it's better if you remember their names and what it was about. The popularity of the Indian plays, this is not Indian again, I'll uh, tell you, I mean the word is Indian but it does not refer to the Indian subcontinent, it refers to the Native Americans. Uh, as the Native Americans were called uh, Red Indians, I don't know Red Indians or Black Indians who were they, but they were called Indians. So the popularity of the Indian plays, Indian plays here means uh, that the plays that uh, were, uh, that had Indians as some sort of character in them or whose characters were uh, played by some Indian people, not Indian people, it means they had Indian character in them, the Native American character, they were associated with it. That began in 1820s, continued through the 1840s, so they lasted till 1840s, for uh, about 20 years. In the early 19th century in American drama, there is a shift in the early 19th century, means in the early 1800s, there is a shift in focus from a nationalistic cause, to the aesthetic values of romanticism for until now uh, romanticism to the american people meant, meant roman uh, romanticizing with their nation with their land uh, feelings of uh, love and emotions uh, for the unity of their land for the unity of the people but now romanticism took a different shape it was about the kind of love between a man and a woman a guy and a girl it was like this kind of love so it took the aesthetic values of romanticism. Aesthetic means concerned with beauty or appreciation of beauty. Edwin Forrest, an immensely popular actor, encouraged the writing of American romantic play. The best American play of the time was Franiska da Rimini in 1885. A romantic verse staged by George Henry Boker. Brutus, The Fall of Terra Quinn by John Howard Payne. This is another American romantic play which was very famous in the third, obviously, the Gladiator by Robert Montgomery Bird were other American romantic tragedies that merely promoted the aesthetic values of romanticism without furthering the cause of the American drama. Okay, so in 1828, Edwin Forrest began to offer annual awards for new plays with American themes. The first to receive the award was Metamora. Metamora, we've studied about before. Here it is. The most well known of such drama was Metamora about Indian, uh, native Indian, the uh, written by John Augustus Stone. So this was the first play that received the award. No one kind of drama appealed to the play going masses of Americans. So they didn't like any one kind of drama. Uh, it means you're stuck on the same thing again and again. The, all, the art, all the playwrights are writing about the same thing. So this didn't appeal to the, uh, to the masses of America. Playgoers were ready to welcome any new type that the actors could perform well. The lampooning of the Indian plays signaled their varying interest. Lampoon means publicly criticizing. So the criticism of these plays, this signaled their waning interest. Waning means come out of toward, uh, decreasing in trust. And by mid-century they started fading. Racial, social and economic tensions in America that brought about the civil war are well represented in Harriet Beecher Stone's novel Uncle Tom's Cabin. Okay, skip this part now moving to American drama in the 19th century. In the 19th century, the most pervasive dramatic genre. Pervasive means spreading widely throughout an area or a group of people. So in the 19th century, the most uh, widespread uh, the most widespreading dramatic genre was melodrama. Again, we're back to melodrama. What was melodrama? A story, play or film in which a lot of exciting things happen and in which people's emotions are stronger than in real life. The same bullshit about a hero, a villain, a, a beauty. That's the same thing. So, uh, similar to what we see in Hindi cinema where a heartless villain Troubles the heroine who is finally rescued by a strong hero in the nick of time. Obviously, the nick of time is a very, uh, is a very important factor. Uh, after fighting insurmountable odds, insurmountable too great to be overcome. Oh, yeah, too great to be overcome indeed. 
melodrama addresses issues of family social position and wealth a preoccupation of every individual so it uh, targeted the uh, the preoccupations of every individual there were issues like family social position and wealth its appeal to the general public lay in its stereotyped easily identifiable character types and in simple formulaic plots that could be easily adaptable adapted to any setting character or even desired i think this was easy there's no need to explain it is there uh the great flexibility of these plays made them easily adaptable to any type of audience allowing actors to use their talents freely taking advantage of a wide range of materials the popular plays in this genre are bocals the poor of the new york delis under the gaslight and belasco's the girl of the golden west and the heart of maryland the popularity of melodramatic form that had begun in the 18th century continued through the 19th century now we move on to realism in american drama but before that let's take a short break now let's continue on to realism in american drama drama after the civil war was marked by a steady shift towards realism illuminating the scene of humble life criticizing social conditions and creating believable characters so after the civil war uh, ended uh there was a steady shift again towards realism uh, which focused on humble life uh, means a simple life here it means not a very uh uh you can say a very uh, simple middle uh, class life like not a very extravagant very rich life uh, where they show lots of cars lots of uh, uh fascinating things it was uh, it was about very simple things like how a sim- uh, how a person simply lived how his life went by what uh, what were the things that normally happened during a person's during an average person's life it uh, there was not a focus on some special characters or really uh, rich or powerful people the actual focus was a middle class man uh, in a sense you can say concerned with the faithful representation of life the playwright concentrated on middle class life uh, like i explained so therefore the playwright had to obviously uh, concern its uh, concentrate itself on middle class life and its preoccupations avoiding larger and more dramatic issues because the average uh, person does not have a lot a very interesting life it doesn't have very dramatic uh, things that take place in his life that uh, have the power to impact something greater than uh, something greater like a nation or st- several states so a middle class person lived a very average life there were not many fascinating things about it and now the playwrights concerned himself with this middle class man so the scenes had three dimensional settings and the actor spoke authentic sounding dialogue which normally people used like you might have seen that in movies there are dialogues uh, they are uh, written in such a way that fascinate the common public but these dialogues the uh, dialogues written in these were very uh, day to day life uh, dialogues where uh, which uh, two normal persons spoke about to each other every day uh, these were the dialogues while the melodramatic plots prevailed so while the, the, there was still a grow, uh, still there was a lot of audience for the melodramatic pl- uh, plots the playwrights however still gradually moved towards psychological realism influenced by henrik ibsen so psychological realism is nothing but simply realism realism as i've already told you what realism was realism is uh still realism is showing things as they really are so it was influenced by henrik ibsen it was a norwegian playwright so henrik ibsen mostly wrote about realism i guess that's why they were influenced by him he was a very great writer henrik ibsen and he invented his own way of writing which uh, we will have a brief over about it a little bit later the late 19th century works bronson howards shannon doa steel mckays hazel kirk and william dean howells mouse trap whatever i think we should mark this up to here yes my highlighter has started working now so yeah you can mark uh, you can write this down as a note 
Uh, Texas, uh, Bronson Howard was more concerned with morals than morality. Realism reached new levels in the last decades of the 19th century and the first decades of the 20th century concerned with the social issues of the time. Benson Howard's a Texas tear, the banker's daughter and Henrietta, a trip to Chinatown, Edward Herringen's dance, Tribulations, and Ben M. Ben Thompson's The Old Homestead, A. Hearn's Margaret Fleming, Shore Acres, and Griffith Davenport. A. Hearn, known for powerful acting and excellent stage management, wrote Margaret Fleming. Margaret Fleming is a very famous play, so I think you should note it down. His greatest achievement. Now they're saying he created an Ibnescu heroine. Now, what is Ibsenescu? Ibsenescu heroine. What is it? So Ibsenescu is nothing but a reminiscent of the style of Henrik Ibsen. Ibsenescu means reminiscent of the style of Henrik Ibsen. What is reminiscent? Remember, resembling or reminding of. So. It was uh, written in a style similar to how Henrik Ibsen, the Norwegian playwright here, here we read about him, the Norwegian playwright wrote here. So the, this was Ibsenisk. So uh, there were several people who later tried to copy his way of writing or took, uh, took inspiration from it and often wrote some of the characters in that similar way of writing. And it was known as Ibsenisk way of writing. Ibsenisk way of writing who was not merely capable by challenging convention but who deftly asserted her autonomy with marriage. Uh, his plays had clarity and simplicity. Whose plays? A. Hearn's plays. Among the late 19th century dramatists David Belasco, Steele McKay and William Gillette were closely associated with the theatre business. Belasco, one of the most well-known producers, also directed his own play. His play, The Girl of the Golden West, deals with rural California in the mid-19th century gold rush days. McKay mostly wrote romantic melodramas. So McKay mostly wrote about romantic melodramas. Melodrama, we've already read, read about melodrama several times. So uh, melodrama is nothing but, uh, like we read, there's a hero, there's a heroine, there's a villain. The heartless villain kidnaps the hero and the hero go, heroine, sorry. And the hero goes on a quest to rescue the princess, that's all. So this was basically what melodrama was, where the emotions are stronger than they normally are. So this is what melodrama and this melodrama basically focused on romantic relationships. All right. This is that is why it was called romantic melodrama. Among them, the most powerful was Hazel Kirk, a melodrama without heroes or villains. I don't know how it was, but I guess it was. The play's theme was familial misunderstanding. So it was about family, uh, familial misunderstanding, misunderstanding in the family. The play was also notable for its more natural dialogue, natural dialogue. Realistic portrayals of sensational subjects were commonly used in the plays of this period. So sensational subjects, the sensational subjects were realistically portrayed like how they actually should be in real life and not just our imaginations. Uh, for example, what example should we take? Like maybe a realistic portrayal of, of a father-son relationship could be that the father provides cares and uh, takes care of all the comforts of the son and the son uh, in return should be dutiful towards the father. Most of the time this is not the case. So in real, uh, uh, in our actual life, this is not the case, right? This doesn't happen. The son is mostly rude towards the father. He does not listen to him and may go on his own way later on even forgetting about what his father meant for him or uh, just doesn't care about him at all in the later days. But here they will, if uh, they had to re uh, portray it realistically, then they will show that yeah, then the father confronts the child. He says that I did this for you. I did that for you. And how are you behaving with me? So bringing these issues to the fore, uh, to the public, would be a realistic portrayal of this relationship between father and son. So this is how realist, uh, realistic portrayals work. Clyde Finch in the early 1900s wrote The City, an entertaining satire using natural dialogues that delved into the evils of shady business and drug addiction. So Clyde Fitch in the early 1900s wrote The City. It was an entertaining satire. Satire again is criticizing people or ideas in a humorous way. So it focused on the evils of shady business. Uh, shady business means you are uh, act, uh, you are doing some kind of business uh, in front of the people. But in the background you are running something illegal. Uh, for example, uh, you are running a pub. 
in front of the people you are a pub owner or you are a bar owner bar, running is bar a bar is illegal but in the background in it uh, in its shade you are actually selling drugs or maybe selling prostitutes something like this so this is called shady business and then drug addiction so this uh, play focused on drug addiction and shady business which was also the first american playwright to write a subtle kind of satire so filch 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 was the first playwright so i think you should uh, mark this too filch sorry his name is filch not filch uh shit what is this where were we filch from filch come on come on come 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 okay mark it till here fitch was the first american playwright to write a subtle kind of satire difficult to detect or grasp by the mind or analyze able to make fine distinctions working or spreading in a hidden and usually injurious way so this is subtle difficult to detect or grasp by the mind or analyze so he wrote a subtle kind of uh, satire you can say it was a kind of mystery uh, it was more on the side of mystery like we have uh, a genre mystery so it was similar to that Social tensions in America began to be explored by playwrights leading up to the First World War. William Vogue Moody's The Great Divide, Rachel Croch's uh, Crothers' A Man's World, and Langdon Michel's The New York Idea, nineteen hundred six, addressed social issues meaningfully while managing to entertain the audience. Right, the American family, its development and disintegration. Disintegration means falling apart. this integration here you go in a decomposed state a loss of organization in some system separation into component parts that dominated the plays so it did uh, where were we that dominated the plays here damn i hate this dominated the plays of this period also became a recurring theme of playwrights in the 20th century In the early part of the 20th century there was a new artistic awakening with a host of american playwrights forming an amateur group the province to 11 players so in the early part of the century a few american playwrights formed an amateur group formed an amateur group uh, together which was named province to 11 players and it was for promoting american drama and producing new plays exclusively by american playwrights so before this anyone could uh, you know uh, write plays and publish them any politicians could sorry any politician could uh, any novel writer could any student could or maybe even the britishers could uh, publish american plays but now uh, this 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 amateur group was specifically for the publishing and production of american plays by american playwrights who were actually in the business of this The efforts of this amateur group set a new course for American theater in the modern period while also launching careers of Eugene O'Neill and Susan Glaspell. So Eugene O'Neill comes from this uh, province to 11 players. They were the people who launched the careers of Eugene O'Neill and Susan Glaspell. Based on a journalistic investigation, Susan Glaspell's one act play Trifles was among its first production so susan glaspell and eugene olin later became a uh, very great playwrights and they were launched by this province to 11 players so one of the first plays in fact by province to 11 players was uh, by susan glaspell whose name was trifles you should mark this point the play's uniqueness comes out with the main character the wife who is never present on the stage up to here then Eugene O'Neill's play The Hairy Ape was the first to introduce expressionism in American drama so i think uh, we should mark this too here
here so developed in germany in the early 20th century expressionism was a movement in the visual literary and performing arts that express subjective feelings and emotions rather than depicting reality objectively so it expressed subjective feelings and emotions rather than re uh, sorry rather than depicting reality objectively Just so the definition of expressionism here is actually too complicated so let's break it up a bit let's make it a little easier here expressionism a style of painting music or drama in which the artist or writer seeks to express the inner world of emotion rather than external reality now this is all still a bit confusing but let me make it a bit simple what it uh, means to say here is that uh, the artist or writer it seeks to express the inner worlds of emotion it means the emotions uh, how you think inside uh, your head inside your brain how you feel how you act inside yourself and in fact how you portray yourself to the outer world so uh, let's understand it through an example. So uh, you meet someone you don't like, right? Let's say you meet some guy you don't like, but in front of him you are shaking hand with him. You will say him lovely things. You will praise him. You'll say, "Wow, you look cool, dude. Wow, you've improved." Or maybe uh, you look better than the last time I saw you. But inside your mind, you're saying things like, "Ah, oh, gosh, where? What the hell did I see this? Uh, whose face did I see early morning? Why did I have to meet this guy? Gosh, I hate this guy." I wish he didn't come, uh, he didn't meet me here. It's, uh, things like this. It means you are just uh, thinking negative things about the person you sp uh, you're shaking hands with in front of him right, uh, right, at, right at that moment, right? So this is expressionism. In expressionism, you will show you the, the actual feelings that you have inside. You will act in that very way. You won't think about what the other people are saying, what other people are thinking. You will act how you actually feel. If you don't like that person, you will say, gosh, get out of my face. I don't like to see you. But in reality, in fact, you, what do you do? You say, oh yeah, man, good to see you. Uh, say, I met you after such a long time. It's wonderful meeting you. You will say things like this. But in reality, you are thinking, ah, I wish I hadn't come, to, uh, come through this way. I wish I hadn't come at this time. I wish I hadn't met this guy. I hate him. I feel like punching him. You will say things like this. So this is what expressionism is. I guess it's a bit clear. So expressionism is depicting your actual inner feelings. Uh, then depicting reality object. In expressionism, the artist is not concerned with reality as it appears, but presents the inner nature with the emotions aroused by the subject. Concerned with the nature of man and the forces that move him, Eugene O'Neill's plays involved characters on the fringes of society. So what does fringe mean? Fringe means a social group holding marginal or extreme views. Uh, this is actually fringe uh, is but here fringe means something different. The outside boundary or surface or something a part of the city. So fringes means on the outermost parts you can say. On the extreme parts. Extreme means uh, the outermost part. Simplest sense it is the outermost part. Uh, involved characters on the fringes of society. So they were on the uh, almost uh, they were on the extreme outside uh, out part uh, parts of the society. Means they were barely part of the society while including speeches and American vernacular for the first time. So his plays also included speeches which were in American vernacular language. Vernacular vernacular languages which which languages? It's a local language spoken by the people. Vernacular. Gosh, what is this? Sorry. So vernacular, vernacular. Gosh, I hate this when it does it. Uh, where were we? adapted from the same novel vernacular here vernacular we have vernacular so vernacular means a characteristic language of a particular group the everyday speech of the people yes so the everyday speech of the people the other prominent playwrights were uh, just a minute here 
The other prominent playwrights were John Reed, Louis Bryant, Max Eastman, and Ida Rue, and Edna St. Vincent Millay. In the 1920s, the most important plays were professionally produced in the New York City stage. The plays of the 1920s and early 1930s were incisive and exciting, such as Lawrence Stelling and Maxwell Anderson's What Prize Glory. Some remarkably fine plays were produced, such as Eugene O'Neill's Strange Interlude, Morning Becomes Electra, lightly satirical plays such as Philip Barry's Holiday, and S. N. Behrman's End of Summer. 1936 was produced. Paul Green's Abraham's uh, Bosom included African-American characters in his plays. Lyricist Oscar Hammerstein 11 and composer Jerome Kern's Showboat. A musical production was adapted. Yes, uh, let's skip it. The economic collapse of the Great Depression of the 1930s led to the permanent closure of many theaters in America. So you must be familiar with the Great Depression of the 1930s. Uh, during this time, there were a lot of theaters closed down because obviously the economic uh, had collapsed so <laughs> they didn't even have enough money to support themselves let alone continue playing uh, continue enacting those plays so basically many of the theaters had to shut down the new sound techlo- technology however in america gave voice to the ma- motion pictures as a result the number of theater goals declined several in the 1930s a new wave was seen in the drama of the 1930s that tackled economic suffering so now the few uh, few plays that were still written and enacted were uh, mainly focused on tackling the economic suf- suffering that people were uh, going through, left-wing political ideologies and fears of another world war. Clifford Odets, Waiting for Lefty, debated the pros and cons of capitalism. Capitalism is a form of uh, is a form of inst- uh, Let's check it out. Uh, the word is not coming into my mind right now. So let's see system is a form of economic system sorry uh, in which people uh, it's a private uh, ownership system uh, like how it's going in america so there are mostly private companies no government companies have control over anything like in india it's a socialist system so in Am- india like there are some government companies see uh, government controls some petrol pumps some lpg gas cylinders mineral companies stuff 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 but in america all of these uh, these things are done by private companies there's a privatization you can say so while awake and sing dealt with the 1930s anxieties lifem hellman's play the children's hour displayed social concerns in the mid 40s the most striking new writings for theater emerged in the works of arthur miller and tennessee williams the latter contributed many psychological plays. Latter means Tennis Williams here. Psychological plays of disillusion such as A Streetcar Named Desire and all these plays. Now moving on. Arthur Miller's modern tragedies All My Sons and Death of a Salesman combined realistic characters and social issues. During the 1950s, Miller's chief contributions were The Crucible and A View from the Bridge. While Tennis Williams played a long day's journey into night received the Pulitzer Prize posthumously. Posthumously means after her death. Tennis Williams. So, which was uh, the play that received the Pulitzer Prize? Long day's uh, journey into night. Sorry, journey into night. Most famous among new playwrights, William Ing wrote Come Back. Little Sheba, a realistic play, late 1950s, also saw new African-American playwriting with Lorraine Hensberry's well-acclaimed play Racing in the Sun. Okay, let's skip it all. You can read it later. The 1990s saw the exciting return of two notable playwrights who thought critics had who thought critics had finished their careers. Arthur Miller's Broken Glass 1944 and Edward Elby's Three Tall Women received widespread acclaim with Elby's work winning the Pulitzer Prize while Miller's play uh, Miller's last play Finishing the Picture was produced in 2004. Now this is important realism continued to be the primary form of dramatic expression in the 20th century that is during the 1900s and as the century progressed many talented new dramatists came to the fore with broad issues now the issue started changing a bit, turning to civil rights and the devastation wrought by the AIDS epidemic. I think till here.
Asian market. In the mid 1990s and beginning of the 21st century, blockbuster musicals eliminated new commercial theater in the United States, targeting the younger audience who were attracted more by films, television, and computer entertainment. Economic difficulties resulted in plays with single setting and lesser characters that would make them less expressive but also less ambitious. So economic difficulties led to uh, simpler settings and lesser characters. There were no many diverse characters to play different roles but in fact the same actors were asked to play different roles. You can say it would make the, the play a little bit boring compared to how it used to be. Uh, but it was all due to the economic difficulties and that's why the uh, theatres became even less uh, entertaining. So people started avoiding or uh, would go to theatres even less than they used to now. So many playwrights started writing plays with film and television adaptation in mind to reach geographically diverse audience, making the American theatre specialized in its alternative. Then we move on to Arthur Miller Life and Works. In 1920, when World War One had come to an end, it was a time uh, in America of the Great Depression that had deeply wounded the American economy and also its psyche. So after 1920, the World War One had ended, but the Great Depression had started. The U.S. prosperity in the 1930s had faced a steep, though short, decline. So U.S. prosperity in the 1930s faced a steep decline. It means a very big decline, very... Uh, Let's check it out. Sharp, sharp inclination of a slope. So a very sharp decline. Though short decline, though it was short. So it means it didn't last very long, but still it was a very great decline. Throughout the decade, throughout the decade, around 600 banks failed along with 20,000 business concerns. Mining, farming and textile industry were on the decline. As a result, there was unemployment. It was during this interesting period of history of America that Arthur Miller, one of the greatest American playwrights, was born. Arthur Miller, born in 1915, died in 2005. An American playwright, essayist and author, was born of moderately affluent Jewish American parents. So his family was a well-to-do family, moderately affluent. Isadore and Augusta Miller on October 17, 1915, Manhattan, New York City. So you can say they were from the upper middle class. His father was an illiterate immigrant, so he had migrated uh, to New York City, I guess. And but he and he was illiterate, so he but somehow uh, from some circumstances he came to own a coat manufacturing business, employing a thousand workers, which was ruined in the twenty in nineteen twenty nine with the Wall Street crash. It was one of the biggest Wall Street crashes ever and it shook the Indian, uh, the American economy completely. Thereafter, the family moved to a smaller house in Brooklyn. The sudden change in fortune had a strong impact on Miller. Miller was fortunate enough to withdraw his entire savings of $12 to buy, uh, $12 to buy himself a bicycle just a day before the United States Bank closed down. Miller though was not very lucky as his bicycle was stolen the same week and he realized that no one was immune from the disaster of depression. So he realized that people might be uh, immune from the uh, this disaster of uh, economic crisis but no one was immune from the disaster of depression. Because of the effects of depression. Uh, Miller's condition was financially unsound and he could not attend the university in 1932 after graduating from high school. After, ta uh, after taking admission at the University of Michigan in 1934, Miller took up a succession of small jobs such as delivery boy, a dishwasher, waiter, warehouse clerk, singer in a local radio station, mice attendant in a laboratory, truck driver, tanker, seaman, factory labor and show fitters helper to pay for his tuition. So you can see how many things he had to actually go through and how deeply he understood uh, the working of the people, how the common uh, man felt, how he worked, how his daily life was. He had seen it from his very eyes. He had actually lived it. Miller studied journalism from the University of Michigan where he ran a student newspaper with a group of others and became its reporter as well as night editor of the Michigan Daily that helped him earn money. Arthur Miller was greatly influenced by his critic and teacher Kenneth E. Rowe. 
so marking it down i guess uh, See, here you can write it as Arthur Miller was born on October 17, 1915 in Manhattan in New York City. His father was an illiterate immigrant from Poland. Uh, because of the Millers. Sorry, you should mark it from here to here. All right. Because of the effect of uh, depression, Miller's condition was finally unsound, and he, in 1932, after graduating from high school, and after he ran a succession of small jobs, what jobs he ran is not important, but you should keep it in mind just in case. Miller studied journalism from the University of Michigan, where he ran, and with a as well as night editor Miller was greatly influenced by critic and teacher Kenneth E. Rowe oh. yeah to here he wrote one play after another and for two years he succeeded in winning the every Hopewood award given yearly at Michigan for the best original play And saw uh, awakens in the play's message. Uh, life should have some dignity. He had a deep. So during one of the vacations, he went to Chicago and saw the performance of Clifford Odette's play Awakened Sing. The play's message, Life Should Have Some Dignity, had a deep and lasting impact on him. Miller wrote his first work, No Villain, for which he won the Every Hopewood Award. This play is about a small garment manufacturer and his university-educated son, Arnold Simon, based on young Arthur. In 1937, Miller wrote another play, Owners at Dawn, which also won the Every Hopewood Award. This play is about the Depression era, dealing with hopes and heartbreaks of the Zabriskie family. So, he had little trouble joining in the theatre to unemployed actor director salary. He had to report at the Federal Theatre Project Office every day and at night he continued writing plays on his own. He completed his play called Montezuma that concerned the conquest of Mexico. However, the project had to close in 1940 as the Congress worried about possible communist infiltration. Miller started working in Brooklyn Navy Yard. He also constituted, so I guess this is not important. Just skip it all. On August 5, 1940, Miller married his college friend Mary Slattery. Sorry, Mary Slattery, yeah, the daughter of an insurance salesman. The couple had two children, Jane and Robert. Robert later became director, writer, and producer of the 1966 movie version of The Crucible. Miller's injury in the left kneecap while playing football in high school exempted him from military service during World War II. Uh, and now let's move on to the next important parts. During war time, Miller wrote, uh, yeah, this is important here, which and ran for 300 despite the same. Here, up to here, this is important. Despite receiving criticism for being unpatriotic, All My Sons won the New York Drama Critics Circle Award and two Tony Awards in the year 1947, the year when our country uh, got won its freedom. So, this play is about a factory owner who sells faulty aircraft part during World War. Here, <laughs> it's written about during World War 11. So, but uh, sorry, it's wrong. It's during World War One. So, in 1948, Miller built a small shed in Roxbury, Connecticut, in which lie in which lie sorry in which he wrote "Death of a Salesman," and it became his best known work, winning Tony Award for Best Play. New York Drama Critics Award and Pulitzer Prize, Death of a Salesman, and for 742 performances. So, this is all important. Yeah. Miller responded to the growing anti communist hysteria of the early 50s by writing an adaptation of Henrik Ibsen's. Again, Henrik Ibsen, the Norwegian playwright, is mentioned here. 
an enemy of the people and the crucible said during 1692 Salem witch trials so this is a little about how the crucible is it's completely messed up if you read it through the book I know it is completely messed up you don't understand the thing so I guess I'll just have to explain it quickly the crucible said during 1692 Salem witch trials in the play Miller likened the situation with the house and American committees activities committee a committee of the house of representatives which set itself to identify present and former communist and so-called fellow travelers in all branches of american life to this witch hunt in salem though the crucible was unsuccessful at the time of its initial release running for mere 197 performances today it is one of miller's most frequently produced plays so the crucible was not a very big success during miller's time but now during our time it is uh, one of his most frequently produced plays in the early 50s, Miller joined a group of writers, publishers and journalists whose objective was to write articles attacking Senator Joseph McCarthy. No newspaper was, published, uh, was willing to publish their articles. The FBI infiltrated their group as a result of which the group broke up. Miller was called, uh, called before the HUAC in 1956 to identify those who attended the meetings which he refused and as a punishment he was fined and sentenced to prison for contempt of congress uh, congress is not the name of government uh, the congress and denied passport to attend the belgium opening of the crucible in 1954 in 1958 the court of appeal overturned his conviction ruling that the chairman of huac had misled about miller his last play of the 1950s, A View from the Bridge, opened in Broadway in 1915 in a joint bill with one of his lesser known plays. Uh, this is not important. Here it gets important a little bit just in June 1956. This is, I think you should know it for just a bit of general knowledge. Divorced his wife Mary Slatter and later that month married Mad Marilyn Monroe. Yes, the very same Marilyn Monroe, the actress. Miller had met Monroe for the first time in 1951 after which had, they had brief affair and kept in touch with each other since then. After his conviction was overturned, Miller started work with his film Misfits in which his wife Monroe acted. He wrote this film as a gift for Marilyn Monroe who lost a child in pregnancy. Shortly before the film's premiere, the two had already divorced. A year later, Marilyn Monroe died why because of overdose of drugs and and obviously he married for the third time their first child rebecca was born in i don't think this is important again in 1964 miller's next play after the fall was released several years later after his last work a strongly autobiographical work it was based on his personal views of his own experiences during his marriage to monroe uh, up to here, this is important. Theatre in Washington and outrage at putting a Monroe character called Maggie on stage. In the same year, Miller produced another play, Incident at Vichy, which ran for 99 performances. Miller was politically active throughout his career, through his, throughout his life. In 1965, he was elected International Pence President and inter an International Writers' Organization that spoke in defense of imprisoned writers. The Price was his most successful play that appeared in 1968 since Death of a Salesman. The Price is based on two brothers who meet one another after years of hostility and separation. So, in 2002, Miller was the first U.S. recipient to be honored with Spain's prestigious Principe d'Austria Prize for Literature. Miller's last play, Finishing the Picture, was produced in 2004 and depicted, depicted the makings of misfits. Okay, so this is again not important. Miller died of heart failure at his home in Roxbury, Connecticut on February 10, 2005 at the age of 89. At the time of his death, Arthur Miller was considered one of the greatest American playwrights. Miller's major plays. So, Death of a Salesman was published in 1949 and is considered a classic of American theatre. 
This play was a caustic attack on the American dream of achieving wealth and success without the regard from for principle. Enthusiastic reviews were written on this play. Death of a Salesman was the first play to win three major awards. It received the Pulitzer Prize from Drama in 1949, Tony Award for Best Play, as well as the New York Drama Critic, uh, Critics Circle Award for Best Play. This is everything about it is important because this eventually helped yeah, uh, Miller no, uh, known internationally. This was the play that set his, his, his international debut. And I am really sorry because I am repeating the words or st stucking up in between. That's because I have dyslexia. So I hope you don't mind it. Death of a Salesman finds the main character Willie Loman in his 60s struggling to come to grips with the fact that his American dream is unattainable. Willie places great importance on supposed native charm ability to make friends, stating that one's lie was known throughout New England, driving long hours but making unparalleled sales. His sons, so in short, uh, Death of a Salesman is about a salesman and how he has uh, great uh, hopes of achieving the American dream that is of becoming uh, very rich you can say the simply very rich he has two sons Biff and Happy and a wife named Linda Willie Loman might have been a superb craftsman but he is forced by the demands of a mechanized world to run in a search of financial wealth so he could have been great craftsman but following the trend he went to search for financial wealth Willie is a traveling salesman for Wagner Company for 34 years. But as time passes, life for him seems to be slipping out of his control. He has worked hard his entire life and likes to think that he is indispensable to the company. It means that if the company uh, removes him or fires him, that the company would be in a very dire state and would not be able to uh, function as, uh, as efficiently as it did with Willie. So you can say that the com company cannot remove, uh, cannot fire Willy because Willy is very, very important to the company. The company cannot run without Willy. So this is what Willy th thought about himself. He closes deals with contractors on the phone since increasing episodes of anxiety and depression are impairing his ability to drive. Soon all of his aspirations fail and he is thrown out of his job as the owner of the firm did not pay enough for his survival and told him that he could no longer represent the firm in New England because he was doing harm to the company. Lowman's fortunes change drastically. He has to depend on loans from his friend Charlie to make ends meet. His 34-year-old son Biff is unable to settle down. The younger son is also on the lookout for some job in order to settle in life. Charlie, on the other hand, becomes a successful businessman. Uh, I don't know who this Bernard is and where he comes from, but Bernard becomes an excellent lawyer. Witnessing his failure, Willie clings to his sons, hoping that they might succeed. Lowman cannot accept that his life uh, has been a failure and that Biff is not interested in big business. He decides to commit suicide in the hope that at least the insurance money, uh, the insurance business will help Biff become successful. The play ends with his family and only friend Charlie grieving by his graveside. Here it's important. Just mark it down. The Crucible. There's a little bit about the Crucible. How uh, there were some people who were supposedly performing witchcraft and they get busted and then they are uh, sent for the trial of witchcraft trial for witchcraft i mean the same court trial whether it means they're set upon a trial whether they actually were performing witchcraft or not so a detective would call from somewhere else and the leader of that witchcraft group used to be his girlfriend so his ex now and I don't think uh, I don't think I can explain it either because I don't understand it myself the explanation about the the uh, summary of this play in the book that IGNO has, IGNO has provided is completely messed up after you read it completely you don't understand what they are trying to say so I guess from here to here to to somewhere to somewhere here 
I don't think it's discernible. It's completely in the mess. But let me explain a view from the bridge. The view from a bridge is also again messed up, but at least it's discernible. I can explain it to you what it is about. It's a play written by Arthur Miller in 1955 and was a one-act words drama on Broadway in 1955. In this play, Miller takes illegal immigrants smuggled into Brooklyn water front from Sicily through friends and relatives, familiarly called submarines. So, friends and uh, relatives smuggled their, their friends and relatives into uh, Sicily through the Brooklyn waters. Oh, I don't know where, but they smuggled their uh, migrants to uh, where they were living illegally. And one, this is about one such illegal immigration, uh, migration. The protagonist of the play is Eddie Carbone, who in a passion of jealousy, informs of, on his wife's relatives. So, he is an uh, Italian-American longshoreman. Longshoreman is someone who, who takes... Uh, and just a minute. Longshoreman. Yeah, longshoreman is something, a laborer who loads and unloads vessels in a port. So this is what uh, Eddie Carbon does. He lives with his wife Beatrice and an orphaned niece, Catherine. But as a move, uh, as a play uh, moves ahead, uh, Cat, uh, sorry, Eddie Carbon develops sexual feelings for his niece, Catherine, which is not so shocking at all. But uh, his wife, Beatrice, uh, smuggles, you can say, uh, illegally migrates two of his uh, two of her brothers two of her Beatrice's brothers two of her brothers uh, to where they were living their name was Marco and Rodolfo and it was a kind of very honorable thing to do so uh, in during uh, in in her in their neighborhood or in their society nearby it was a kind of very proudful very honorable thing to uh, illegally smuggle migrants uh, into their neighborhood so this is what she does. But what happens is that as soon as Catherine's eyes falls on Rodolfo, that is Beatrice's cousin. Cousin, I guess it was a cousin. I don't know what. Yeah, Beatrice's cousin. She falls in love with him. All right. And because of this, Eddie Carbone, who had a sexual attraction towards his niece, gets jealous and as Catherine gets ready to marry Rodolfo, he... Uh, leaks out all this information about the illegal migrant uh, migrant ship of his wife's cousins to the local police and what does the police do the police uh, puts both of them in jail so rodolfo and marco are both put into jail but what happens is that marco gets bail i don't know how but somehow marco gets bail and when he comes out to have his revenge on eddie who had told about him and his brother eddie draws out a knife in order to, I don't know, maybe self-defense or maybe to kill Marco and finish this whole business up. But Marco comes out stronger and in fact directs the knife towards Eddie itself, who is killed in the ensuing battle. The play comes to a climax with the fight between Eddie and Marco. Eddie attacks Marco with the knife, but stronger Marco turns the blade into Eddie, killing him. And Eddie dies in Beatrice's arms at the end of the play. Happy ending. All My Sons opened on Broadway at the Coronet Theatre on January 29, 1947, ran for 328 performances. The theme of the play is that of moral responsibility in the family and the inner struggle of men in authority during the war. Uh, you know what? Actually, I don't need to go into any depth about All My Sons because I've read the, uh, the ensuing three chapters and it's completely about All My Sons. They have uh, given every detail possible that there could be about this play so I don't think so that we still need to uh, read all this up read this summary about all my sons so I'm gonna skip this summary simply and you guys can wait for the next unit unit 2 all my sons detailed study but before that I highly recommend you that you actually read this play all my sons because I, uh, being honest I simply hate IGNU books all right so it would be better if you uh, some if you read uh, read this all my sons uh, this play first uh, how it was originally written i don't have any link or pdf of it but i'm sure you can search it up on google so until next time see you